All right. Well, good morning, everybody. This is Jomo Stewart here at the Fairbanks Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we have a, well, we have a very special day uh, ahead of us. So we have a very special guest to start that day. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone who has shown up in person. I know this is new. We've all gotten habituated to enjoying these presentations from the comfort of our beds. Um, well, everybody but me. Um, but so thank you very much for coming. So again, our very special guest today, well, let's start with just the day itself. So I've been calling this uh, Fairbanks Nuclear Thursday uh, because with the recent release of the RFP relative to the demonstration, deployment and demonstration of a micronuclear plant uh, at Eielson Air Force Base, uh, we are blessed to have a whole number of vendors of cutting edge uh, nuclear reactor technology here in our community. And so there'll be a number of events throughout the day. Uh, so of course we get to start here. Thank you very much. Uh, Task Force member piece for arranging this. We have with us Mr. Eddie Saab, the president of Westinghouse, here to discuss their specific technology, Evinci. Uh, but throughout the day, uh, there's going to be a meeting up at the university. And then finally, uh, the vendors have uh, been gracious enough to make themselves available to we, the Fairbanks community, this evening at the Pipeline Training Center. There's going to be a big town hall, up to six vendors. Uh, it'll be moderated by Ms. Gwen Holdman, uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for research up at UAF, uh, former top at the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. So ourselves here at FEDC, the Alaska Center for Energy and Power and UAF, hosting a town hall where uh, the vendors, a number of vendors, uh, will be uh, making themselves available, talking about their technology, and then asking questions, or excuse me, answering questions from the public. So a big day here in our community. But to start, yes, we have Mr. Eddie Saab here at Westinghouse and team. Um, and so the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, great. Thank, thank, thanks so much, uh, Jomo. Thanks for coming here in person. It's uh, it's nice to do these and, and see some faces and get reactions in real time. Usually I'm, I'm Sitting, sitting in front of the screen there. So you, you probably saw uh, my title there is President of Westinghouse Canada. You're probably asking yourself, well, why is the president, president of Westinghouse Canada in Alaska? I know Alaska is not part of Canada, but uh, <laughs> uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of similarities, really, when you think a bit about yeah. the, the the possibilities for Vinci, which we'll talk about, uh, and similarities between Canada and Northern uh, Territory that we have, and then also Alaska. But I have two roles within Westinghouse. So one is the president of Westinghouse Canada, where I see all the oversight and operations of Westinghouse Canada, primarily in Ontario, where we have a number of Canada nuclear power plants. Uh, but my other role, really, and the reason I'm here today is uh, looking at business development opportunities for the Americas, so our North America, South America, on our entire energy systems portfolio. Um, I don't think we have slides here, but I'll spend a, a minute or two after we do maybe some introductions on, on who Westinghouse is and what we have in our portfolio. But that's everything from the large reactors, the AP1000s, all the way down to the Vinci micro reactor that, uh, that we're also passionate about because we see it an opportunity uh, to really uh, enable a lot of uh, uh, new, new innovations, but, but also solve a lot of challenges and more importantly for today. Mary, I told me slow down, but you were talking so fast. I feel like I had to compete with you. <laughs> um, coming back to, to today's session, uh, we have, I think, seven, eight slides, Mary. Right, right. Uh, I've got the, the good luck of having Mike Valor with us today. He was actually up here yesterday for the Arlson Air Force walk down, and he's the brains behind the invention and the strategy there. So we'll probably tag team this because he knows a lot more than I do. Uh, but we want this really to be more of a, a dialogue, you know, as opposed to us going through slides and presentations. Uh, the important thing for us, for me, really, is not for you to just be inundated with technical information. It's really for you to start informing us to help us uncover what the challenges are going to be, what the opportunities are going to be, you know, things that we just need to have some perspective from. Because, you know, one thing... I'm guilty of, I can't really speak for us, but I'm guilty of, is just thinking I know all the answers and hey, there, there's there's a sweet spot here. Uh, what we're trying to do with this product is, is really engage more, listen more, figure out everything before we go ahead and say, hey, we got a problem or a, a solution for for your challenge or, or for your need here. So thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, with that, maybe I'll hand it over to Valor to introduce himself and then Marianne, which I think she knows everyone. So, uh, so we'll go through the list there. Mike Fleur, a senior director for advanced reactors on the commercial side, but really been working on with the technical team. You know, been actually one of the first times I came to Alaska was sitting 
I think I'm not in that chair, but uh, you know, at FEDC really kind of introduced this technology. We've been working on it for multiple years, but we weren't really talking about it. And actually, one of the first public discussions we did about the technology, probably the first in Alaska, was, was here. So happy to be back. Um, I think it's been two years now, maybe, since that presentation. The time has gone by fast. So, um, but yeah, really happy to be here again. I'm um, excited about the opportunity at the Air Force Base, but but just as Eddie said, you know, well, the reason we came up in the first place was not just, hey, look at this cool thing. It's, what could we use this for? What are some of the things you know we really need to be considering um, from the folks who really know the area best? So really glad to be back. Absolutely, Mary Ann Pease. Uh, uh, thrilled to be working with the incredible team at Westinghouse. And you know, one of the things I look at is over my career here in Alaska, it's always been focused on energy and delivering those energy solutions for all our communities. And even though we're blessed with all these natural resources, energy is always a challenge. And as you look at the future going forward, the zero emissions opportunity of micronuclear and getting it out to our communities in a sustainable way that they can have a secure power supply, energy supply for a long period of time. You know, that's that's the way we need to be moving. And it the great thing about it is it works in concert with other forms of energy, renewables, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So again, looking forward to the presentation here today. Uh, and uh, Eddie, I know that you're gonna have some great questions because we have some technical experts <laughs> in the room today. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, go but, ahead. Yeah, so I, I did go to school as an engineer, but I stopped playing when about 20 years ago, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's okay. Some in the room never stopped playing. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would ask, uh, before we get started in earnest, um, just want to confirm with those online that you're seeing the presentation in the share screen. Okay, excellent. Uh, Thank you, Chancellor Rogers. And then a reminder to the group, again, this is for you all. Um, so please know, as always, uh, that you can just take yourself off mute if you have any questions uh, or need to, or want to make a comment or need further clarification. Uh, because of the format today, it's a little hard to read the chat, so I really would encourage you to just go ahead and raise your hand or take yourself off mute if you you have any questions. Again, this is this is for you all. Um, all right, sir. Please. All right, well, let me just go to the first slide there and then pull it. That's fine. Perfect. So just a, a bit about uh, our company itself. If you don't know about Westinghouse, a uh, fairly large company, we're, we're pretty much the, the commercial pioneers of nuclear power, starting with uh, the first uh, commercial reactor in shipping port in 1957. So, you know, our roots have been in nuclear the whole time. You probably see, I'm sure in Alaska, you have a lot of products that say the Westinghouse name on it. Uh, everything from generators to fridges, uh, LCDs, uh, even the massage chair, which I don't have one of those. But um, <laughs> the reason behind that is uh, back uh, several years ago, just uh, 20 years ago, more or less, uh, CBS, uh, the broadcasting channel, Westinghouse, the electrical company had bought CBS. And then CBS ran the business and eventually sold the nuclear or the energy part of the business away, but kept the name. So whenever you see Westinghouse on a product out there, you know, don't call the president of Canada to help you out there. <laughs> <laughs> I get that a lot because of LinkedIn, but uh, it, it's really because CBS licenses that name. It's actually, so I just got corrected on this. CBS sold it recently to the guys who run the little generators. So the so guy who owned that company has a name. got a PE firm and bought the name from CBS, like some just months ago. I, I keep telling Patrick, our CEO <laughs> and our board, that we just need to buy our own name. Yeah. That way it's, it makes life easier. But uh, anyways, that just... It was, this, it was like $100 million or something. Uh, to give you guys a reference, just for the brand yeah. Alone. I mean, it's a powerful brand. I remember John yeah. telling me just a little over the commercial there. Anyways, co coming back to the electro company, because that's who we are. Well, I was going to say, uh, before you were nuclear, you were the, you all gave us AC current. As it yeah, to that, DC. That, that's exactly right. I was just watching a, a documentary on it mm -hmm. on PBS. Uh, George, uh, actually, I was in the Vienna at the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and they had this really nice setup on uh, 
George Westinghouse and, and Tesla, you know, working together to bring uh, EC power to, to get. Hello. Hello. Sorry, I'm a little late. No, no, no worries. So, in, in terms of size, Westinghouse is about 14,000 people in total. Um, and that's, uh, we almost doubled in size earlier this year. I think it was back in May, we made, made an acquisition for BHI Energy. Uh, so bringing in into the fold, which really almost doubled the size there, but a global company, 19 countries. Uh, and I think I mentioned some of the other stuff there, but really our focus is on the nuclear side of things. Uh, the life cycle, uh, the whole life cycle of nuclear, all the way from full fuel fabrication to reactor design. Um, and I don't know if we have a slide in it, but I'll touch on that in a second. To servicing the operating plants globally. Uh, I think about 50% of plants around the world have some sort of Westinghouse technology in them. Uh, so we have a broad reach of knowledge and capabilities, but also recognize that you know there is some legacy uh, expectations and needs and commitments we have to make on the back end of stuff. So we have a very large uh, waste management and D and D business that continues to grow. Uh, so yeah, again, uh, probably in the right spot, the right time with what's going on in the geopolitical side of things to to really take a look uh, a good look at nuclear because we believe. Uh, the transition to net zero is going to be very difficult with, without uh, an energy source. And I do want to say, just this is, has never been in my mind, nuclear is better than everything else. I think nuclear is a complement to oil and gas, complement to natural gas, complement to renewables, right? There is a nice, healthy mix that needs to be, and we need to use all the technologies, all the abilities together to, to get the right mix, because in different jurisdictions, that mix is going to be very different, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to keep a, keep an idea of that. So it's it's never nuclear is the only solution. I think it's part of the solution. We'll leave this as we look at it. Um, just can you go to the next slide? I, I didn't memorize these slides, but I want to make sure. Okay, so well, that's the Vinci side. Um, just before we jump into the Vinci, and I'll get Valor to maybe help me on that side of things. In, in terms of the energy system portfolio, you know, I mentioned we have a couple of different elements, right? So we have our large AP1000 reactor. It's an 1100 megawatt nuclear power plant. We built the first four in China. We've got two up and coming in in Vogel in, in Georgia. Uh, we've got uh, the Chinese building a derivative of that. I think four more coming up. And if you've been following Westinghouse in the news, uh, we're also working uh, with a number of countries in Eastern Europe uh, to provide them with some energy security because they are very reliant on, on Russian on gas and, and, and oil there. Uh, so you probably see a lot of announcements in terms of MOUs with Poland and uh, Ukraine, Slovakia, Slovenia, Estonia, Bulgaria. A lot of exciting things happening in the world, which is motivating us to, to move other technologies forward. Uh, so that's a large side of things. We also have some complementary SMRs. We're looking at lead pass reactor, trying to determine what we're going to do with the light water reactor as well. Uh, one thing that's new to the portfolio is actually energy storage. Uh, so long duration energy storage we've been looking at. Uh, it's not a nuclear technology. It really is just um, typical uh, pump thermal storage, essentially, uh, using a concrete uh, uh, oil infused uh, basin as, as a reservoir. So we've had a lot of conversations with utilities who want to maybe use that uh, to complement renewables as opposed to uh, nuclear itself. But that I'm question just came up last Friday. I did a presentation on on this energy group yeah. uh, to the Sunrisers Rotary, and there was a question regarding thermal storage. Oh, great! And it actually, you know, the, the two things that were danced around were water yeah. uh, and sand. I know that there's uh, there in Scandinavia, they're doing some work with sand yeah. as a as like a thermal mass yeah. to hold heat. So the exact same concept in the sand. We've actually used concrete with infused with. Uh, with the oil and it's uh, to your point, just we we recycle the heat back and forth. So freeze it up and, and, and warm it down to, to the energy. I think it's a it's a 1000 megawatt hour. Okay, so it's a it can it can control it can it's hold pretty large, yeah. yeah, 100 megawatts of power for 10 hours. So 100 megawatt hours. And uh, what's interesting is we've been having conversation with utilities who can who have looked at the uh the business case to to charge it up with excess steam. As opposed to use electricity to to to, uh, to store the electricity. So interesting concept. It's new for Westinghouse because it's non-nuclear, but it also adds to our portfolio. Looking at just other technology that complement what we're doing here. The the story of Vinci is actually quite. Uh, I feel like it's more of a folk tale. Oh, question, well, actually, if I may. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um. And again, I would let the group know this isn't the Jomo show. This is all for you. <laughs> um. So fire away with your questions. 
You mentioned 1,100 megawatts yep. and your large scale nuclear. And I come from Virginia and right across Hampton Roads is the Surrey Nuclear Power Plant, yep. um, which is rather large. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know the total acreage, but it's over 100 acres. I mean, it's the one that has the giant cooling towers. It looks like your classic, my, my as we say, my grandparents and parents nuclear. Mm -hmm. um, this is much, this is different. No, it, it, it's very different, right? So um, maybe coming back to this folklore story I've heard about Da Vinci, I don't know how much of it is true anymore because it's it, as it's as it's matured, it's 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 got a, a, lot, a lot more a lot more uh, embellished. Yeah, embellished, I'd say. <laughs> uh, but but really, if you rewind maybe uh, several years ago, seven eight years ago, you know there wasn't a recognition from our engineers at Westinghouse that we had this large, massive power plant on lots of acres providing nuclear energy. But you know there was a need really for. Uh, remote communities, off-grid applications, um, you know, areas that could benefit from nuclear power, but just didn't have the ability to, 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 ho to host a, a large reactor. So the team started looking at different technologies, uh, and one that came up uh, to, to the uncovered, what they knew about was uh, the, the kilopower program at NASA. And it was just a, essentially a small little, uh, a uh, heat pipe reactor providing kilowatts of power uh, on the USS Voyager spaceship there. Um, and so the, the team really looked at, well, can we take that concept and scale it up so where it's a commercial practice, practical for commercial applications? Because you, know, you, you don't want a little microwave being powered by nuclear power. It, just, it, costs, it costs a fortune. <laughs> you know, but what, what is the right size and scale to allow us to take that technology, scale it up, but also one that was large enough to, to maybe keep it mobile, keep it transportable, and maybe check off some of the things that we couldn't do with nuclear before because of the large footprint, right? And, large and, that's, footprint. and that's really the, the, the journey that uh, Westinghouse had gone through. So uh, uh, a couple of years ago now, I think it's almost four or five years ago, we licensed that technology from uh, Los Alamos. You know, so what we did as Westinghouse is did the engineering to, to see, well, how, how far can we scale this up? What's the right size that can still fit in a shipping container? You'll see a little bit more about that in a second, but 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 also allow us to, to unlock the potential in some of these applications we, we, we know about. And, and Steve, you had mentioned uh, greenhouses, right? Uh, it, think about the idea of being able to have greenhouses in, in Alaska or Northern Canada, right? Uh, to, to maybe power desalinization plants around the world or a, a, a nuclear battery that can help with um, uh, so supporting it, um, devastated areas, right? So if there's a disaster or a challenge, there's having a, a five megawatt power plant. So as we've sort of matured this technology in parallel, we've had people, communities, engineers outside the organizations come to us and say, oh, we can use this for application A, B, and C. So that's what's been exciting about this journey is, you know, as we are maybe sometimes close-minded to see what we need to do as Westinghouse to, to mature and develop this technology and get it licensed and available. At the same time, we're starting to wrap our heads around what, what can be done with the technology. So, yeah, yeah, back at that time as well, I'll just point out the engineers looked at not just the technology to scale up, but also several of them, including Yuri, you know, came up to Alaska quietly, like this is like six years ago, as well as Nunavut, and went out to some of the communities, went out, talked to some of the utilities, and also some constructors and said, what could, what can you actually physically install in some of these places? And that also fed into this type of design. Because you know, we it's easy to design a reactor on paper that will work somewhere, mm -hmm. but this is a fairly challenging environment, right? As, as you guys know much better than us, but we felt that this heat pipe design, keeping it compact, all these things, was really the only way our folks saw to support and actually be able to physically be installed in some of these these locations. Right, and even Fairbanks, you know, is is quite accessible, but it's still a pretty challenging mm -hmm. geotechnical and other thing, you know, soil and permafrost and all those things. Right, so we try. We've been trying to build in what is really the needs of 
the areas we plan to deploy in the future from from the very start. Um, you can always do more, but we we, we really we just thought you can. It's easy to design a reactor on paper, but we have to actually make it work for what the vision actually is. So um, that's it's not. Yeah, you know, I've been up here now five five six times to Alaska. We had you know Marianne on board. You know we're starting to talk about bringing on some engineering staff up in Alaska. Um, we have a couple Alaska Native Corporation partnerships now. Uh, so so we've been doing a lot in these last two years to really prepare. This isn't just the Westinghouse project either. In fact, you know, we think of the Westinghouse, we have to bring a reactor, we have to do that. <laughs> but basically everything else is for the benefit of and to be installed by and operated by you know, the folks in Alaska. We don't, we don't plan to just send hundreds and hundreds of people to Alaska someday. So, um, you know, I think we're starting to set the right base. You know, we're getting very, uh, you know, a lot of good information on, you know, the, the last two years from from really you, you guys um, that have helped us develop this. But, of course, it's always music to our ears, uh, that kind of transition planning. Um, you understand that coming on the front end, you'll need that assistance, that technical assistance mm -hmm. from outside. Um, but again, that over time, you know, we can build that expertise here. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, there's so much capability here. You know, and, and honestly, one of the things I was shocked by when I first came up is the, the average person's knowledge of energy in Alaska is like an order of magnitude higher than the lower 48 states anywhere. Well, right. when you live in one of the coldest, darkest <laughs> exactly. areas in the yeah, country exactly. where the prices yeah. through the roof, that'll do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, we were really excited about that because usually it's like you're starting from like truly a uh, base of knowledge, whereas, but it's like, well, you can, you can talk to almost everybody up here about energy and they really understand it. Um, so we got a lot of good feedback. I mean, basically technology has not changed really since even two years. You know, what, what is it able to do? Um, do you know, have a question? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. I did. Sorry, I can't hear. Yeah. Six, seven, so seven. it's high speed load following capabilities. So how high speed is that? Is that comparable with gas turbines? Do you have a make watch per minute? It is, it is gas turbine similar. So the reason is uh, we're using an open air brain cycle for the power conversion. So our power conversion side is basically is an air-driven gas turbine. So if we need to load shed immediately, we can open a bypass valve, basically, you know, only have enough flow to keep the turbine circulating air, but not, we can cut it off from the grid. Um, and then for load pickup, you know, if it's something that's going up and down quickly like that, we just control with that bypass valve, how much we're really putting into energy we're putting into the turbine. Now, if it's relatively slow, then we want to conserve fuel life and we'll we'll do a combination of you know bypass valve power conversion side and also changing reactor power. It all depends on the application, but we can do you know second or less. We could even, you know, with some battery, we could get to millisecond type ranges. Um, it's quite versatile. What if there isn't a grid? Uh, we can grid form in a microgrid. Okay. Yep. So we have um you have it turned down all the way to near zero. Yeah, so we can load follow throughout the entire zero to five. We can actually run the reactor at full power and just exhaust hot air to atmosphere. Um, so it's it's versatile across that entire range. The reactor itself can go about 20% um, in a minute, but then we wouldn't want to go 50% in two minutes or 40% in two minutes. It's a little bit slower as you go and you're really trying to go down in power. But you can do most of it in power conversion. And you are know, um, Is there manual override as well as the, the automated system? Yeah. So from a controls perspective, we're pretty much only giving the operator the ability to manually shut down or start up. Um, the, and, and you'll see it, there's there's really nothing to control in this machine manually. So so all your controls are intrinsic. You, you guys are installing them in there, and you just have an output with an on off. So then, how do you use that to load follow if you your AGC can't control that? The control system would would be sensing changes in voltage, frequency, all those things to actually change the but power. That means you'd have to program the scenarios ahead of time for it to be able to respond to them um, and you don't really have your ATC controlling it. 
we would definitely be able to program all the different scenarios that the reactor could see, right? If there are certain things that would happen, you know, the reactor would trip perhaps, you know, but in almost all the scenarios, if we're, if we're, we can operate in a grid forming mode and basically we're making the grid and we can, as soon as the demand starts to increase and you have even a tiny amount of voltage drop, it's gonna ask the reactor or the power conversion to pick up for the reactor, right? What, what we're reacting to are very sensitive changes in voltage and frequency to drive what so, the reactor does. So then what if we're going the other way? And as I assume most people would want to use this as base loaded, yep. but if your thing's responding like that and I can't control it because I only have an on off, then how do I keep it base loaded? How would you keep it base loaded? <laughs> so it depends on the application. If it was in a very small grid, Right, you'd have you'd have microgrid system set up such that you're giving the reactor priority of load, right? So it's going to have to interact, in, especially in a small grid. But every small grid, everything has to somewhat interact together, right? But what we're not really giving the option to do is to you know slowly manually click down. We we can control this from an INC perspective much faster than a an operator can click up two percent, three percent, five percent in either any direction. So yeah, I mean, we we basically our AP one thousand plant is a fully automated control system. I mean, the operators don't even really need to do much for that plant, and that's a full size nuclear power plant. So, so in this, are you having to know your mode of operation when you install it? Would you even base load, or would you even allow it to be regulated? I mean, I can see in the villages where you want it to regulate when it's probably going to be your own power source, but up here. Even in our small system, we have multiple generation assets. And so it may not be the one we want to, we may want it to regulate, but we may want it to mm -hmm. base load. How would we, is there any way of setting that up or do I, we have to pick a mode when we just yeah. install it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the reasons we call it a nuclear battery is because it works like the concept of a battery. The more energy you pull out, the quicker the reaction, the less you pull out the slower reaction, right? So if you think of it, the Vinci as a battery itself, what controls the speed is really what you're taking out of it, right? So you're not really controlling it like a large power plant where you're saying, hey, I need to output this percentage, which we could if we wanted to design that the INC. Mm -hmm. What's governing the speed of the reaction is really the, the ability of it to take out the heat. So if you've got a base load that's pulling all the heat, it's running 100%. But if you've got an application that's using only less of the heat or drops down, your reaction slows down because that's all it's doing. It's just depending on how much heat's being extracted, that's where the load falling is coming from. Okay. So I didn't understand that you know, it says right up there nuclear battery, but that's what the that this is really doing. It's not generation you're looking at, you're creating this battery system. It, 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 it's very much like a battery, and you'll see here it, it's it's this is not a a very complicated pumped flow system. It's basically a solid state reactor that's just wicking heat off. It's like the so, it's like the battery in your, your laptop. It just uses the same heat pipes, right? Yeah. It's the exact same. So product. a typical plant, right? If you're in a, like a large plant, and one of the reasons why most of the large plants don't do much load fall, actually, is because you know a grid system operator has to say, all right, we need you to turn down the load at this time. It's a pretty slow process, right? And then they got to start clicking buttons to reduce, you know, pump speeds and also a huge number of factors, right? This is basically you're you're just following the the voltage frequency on the things that the grid is telling you it needs, right? Through very small changes, sure. and just the battery, reactor will change. Do the that. battery that charges it so it's like yeah, yeah. It's pretty basically yeah. charges for the uranium. And it's discharging at the, at the rate that the grid is going to allow it to. But you're right, though. We can operate in a grid forming mode, a follow mode, precedent. You know, you know, will the operator be able to change that instantaneously? You know, perhaps not. Perhaps yes. We could build that in. It's it's not. It's very easily able to be done, right? So we could have it in grid forming mode or follow mode or just base load and have. The, you know, it's all loaded on the software. Someone could choose those different modes. You don't have to decide it when you install it. That's what they make it look most powerful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they can choose it later. Yeah, yeah, you can switch it. You can you definitely do it. Talk about just an 
on off input, but there's a little more of a weak yeah. and some modes. Yeah, absolutely. So you do with our current package. Yeah, right. yeah. So what I meant of the, the controls really is on off, as in there aren't any valves or pumps where you have to physically change positions of pieces of equipment to get your output. Mm -hmm. This is you can you can definitely tweak the controls for your application. And, and you could even change them as time goes by, right? And we actually want to do that. You know, we'd want to optimize fuel life versus power output. So, you know, when we're talking about about load falling, like if you, if we say, hey, this is how we think we're going to operate the reactor, we'd have the controls optimized for that situation. It'll be able to deal with things outside of that situation. But if it's outside of that situation, it might not be an ideal control. We might be running the reactor at 100% power too much and doing too much bypass where too much heat is just being wasted. So then we would say, okay, we want to optimize the controls and change really to optimize fuel life and still get the exact same output. So there will be some iterative process in there to get it like perfect for the application, but that's pretty typical. Right. Thanks. Yep. Miss Lee. So I have a couple questions. Um, <laughs> could you help me understand a little bit more about the graphite core block and the control drum? The other parts yeah. of it are pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, maybe go on. Well, well, we'll, yeah. we'll do this. Yeah, we'll we'll go ahead quick. and finish up this slide. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so five we'll megawatts, uh, we can capture the exhaust heat uh, that's remaining, which is about 200 degrees C, which is about 350, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Eight years for refueling would actually like to get that to 10 before the first reactor is installed, but there's some testing we need to do in the fuel um, to try to push that that life up. But eight years, so pretty, pretty solid for, you know, you pretty much know your cost for that entire period of time. And you can actually hedge uranium for even longer. Um, transporter, we talked about, we want to be able to actually get it to where we need to go. Um, I see this is really the only SMR quote unquote that's transportable. Now, everybody's saying that, but it's 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 most of these technologies, you're just transporting lots of stuff. And SMR is small modular reactor. Correct. Right. Yes. But many of those are actually very large as well. Um, minimal onsite personnel would actually see this to be operated much more like a research reactor. So US research reactors, for instance, they are operated generally by a grad student. And they are generally secured by local police response. Um, because, and they're actually very similar size, if not the same size, actually, as this unit. Um, so that's what's interesting about a true micro reactor versus a, an SMR is we're, we're in a whole different regime of what's required by the NRC from operation and security. And there's a lot of analogs to, well, research reactor at MIT is sitting in downtown Cambridge, Massachusetts. It has had high enriched uranium in it before, like weapons grade enrichment. And it's been secured by campus police and operated by grad students, <laughs> right? And this, this is actually a simpler operation even than that. So, you know, we're, we're quite excited about, you know, it's not going to be something that needs, you know, a hundred person site because it would, it would never be economical if that would be the case. And now what we can just, we can, we can skip through Joe to the next well, slide. Just, 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 just to close the slide off. So just on the eight year refueling, that's at running at a hundred percent. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we have an application that you're mentioning that only needs one megawatt, right? You can still use this design, this technology for five times as long, right? So it can operate yeah. that. So it's fuel poor. Yeah. 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 So in the summer, you're not going to be drawn with much on this at all. Yep. In the winter, you're probably going to be driving harder. So it'll yeah, so last, last lot, twice as long. Mm -hmm. right? So it's yeah. 18. Yeah, it's 18, pretty close to linear. 60 relationship. Yeah. Uh, and the other point, too, is so it doesn't require any external water, no water, right? So we're not using water. The, the only output is hot air. I think that's that's the input is cold air. Output is hot. Okay. So I think there's a lot of cold air in Alaska. So <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like colder. How are you running your turbine? Um, the turbine is uh, multi shaft, two shaft. It's basically a compression, uh, a compression fan that's blowing air through the heat exchanger, which is then taking heat from the reactor, and then it goes through an expansion turbine. It's the open air brain cycle that you have mentioned yeah. before, just hot air. Yeah, and we did, there's a preheat and there's a regenerative cycle in there, but it's 
it's kind of a, a typical um, Rankin type cycle warming there, <laughs> pretty much. So a couple of questions before we jump. Yeah. So again, this is a mock-up of what we're seeing on the screen, and it looks relatively about the same size as we just had a presentation on the new scale uh, technology. Uh, so two acres hmm. footprint, yeah. four, again, just again, uh, on a size basis, an acreage basis, yep. quite compact. Yeah, yeah. So ours is, we can get, um, you know, certainly to about an acre total space. Our building there would be about a 60 foot by maybe 45 foot building for two bays. Oh, and the blue and the white boxes are relatively scaled to just your standard conics. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah, that building is the maximum width across the front of that building is 60 feet. Okay. So the new scale design is, I think, very much concept stage right now, I believe. Um, you know, they haven't really been talking about that one at all publicly. Um, we are we are now much more into building testing. Let's go demonstrate this at Idaho National Labs phase. Uh, so we actually just sent letters to Enric, who you got to meet at Idaho National Lab, or at least Jomo did, um, to do our demonstration at the lab inside the EDR2 dome, dome. they have. Yep. Okay. So th this was the technology there. You're trying to be the technology to deploy in that dome. Yeah. So there's two. We are the second um, that are planned. So the first is the Pele program, which is the mobile microreactor that BWST is DO, developing. That's DOD. Or DOD. Mm -hmm. um, that is not. Uh, I'm, they would even say this themselves. So I think it's okay for me to say it. It, it's not optimized for commercial cost. Theirs is truly for a DOD application, like a military. So it's got all sorts of specific things such that you could actually move it into different areas. It, you know, it's a one megawatt or so, it's one of the like semi mobile reactor, but it's a, it's a different mission a bit. Um, this we see is truly right now the smallest of the five megawatt scale. Micro reactors actually by a, a fairly wide margin. I think that that's a critical attribute. All right, we're about to move to the next slide. Uh, anything from the gang online? Okay, just know that you may. So, graphite cooler control drums. Oh, it's <laughs> 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 out right at the right time. So, no, no problem. So um, this is the entire reactor system. Again, it's not changed since you know I was here you know, a couple of years ago, but it is extremely compact and simple machine. Um, what we don't have is the reactor cooling system, which is usually a pumped cooling loop, which is why you know you have all these components then, and to do real load following, you have to have somebody constantly managing. All these components and the control systems are not pretty good at that, but there's still some manual things that have to be done when you have pumps and valves on a complicated mechanical system. We're doing all the heat transfer with this with or with heat pipes. So basically, very similar to a thermosiphon design. And so what Westinghouse has been doing, and I don't know if there's pictures in this deck or not, but there we've been building and testing heat pipes now for, for quite some time to operate at, at the high temperatures of a nuclear environment and also in an irradiated environment. Um, you know, we've spent now probably four or five years and tens of millions of dollars to develop how we're actually gonna be able to build those and test them. And we've now built, built them and tested them. You know, when I was first here, we were just starting to do some four foot heat pipes, which you know were you know kind of the early material selections and things we've done. Oh, I remember that. Yep, we've now uh, we are finishing a uh, 12 foot pipe right now, and we've run tons of four foot pipes. We had we have one in the MIT research reactor right now being irradiated. That's like the third one. So we're doing all this characterization, all this material testing. But the heat pipes is the key of this reactor because it allows you to not have any of the other stuff. 
So some people asked some good questions yesterday. You know, well, how, you know, nuclear has been somewhat expensive. How could you make it economical and go small? Which I think is an awesome question. The only way we thought that could be done was you can't just make your big thing smaller because you still have all the stuff, <laughs> right? So, you know, if, if you took an AP1000 and you shrunk it down to five megawatts, you probably have the same amount of security almost. You probably have the same amount of operators. You just have a really small, complex machine. Expensive. And a lot of folks are doing that right now in micro reactors. Right? So they're taking old technologies like high temperature gas reactors, some of these things, and they say, well, I can, I can just make it smaller and somehow all will be well. But I, we, don't, we don't really see that because there's all these then operational costs, mechanical equipment costs and nuclear, all these things that have you know, pretty high price tags that you can't get rid of. This technology got rid of that whole reactor coolant system and all this secondary systems that support a reactor coolant system. Mm -hmm. So that allows us to have basically a solid state reactor. So those heat pipes are constantly wicking heat out of the core. You know, it's basically almost impossible to stop that from happening, which is actually good. Uh, the only way you stop it from happening is you actually have to stop the heat generation. And so the way we control reactivity and power level is these control drums. So the drums, if, if this was on its side, which we actually don't show the exact core layout on its side because that could be export controlled information, but it's a bunch of hexagons almost in a cylinder. And then there's control drums around the outside of that cylinder. And the drums will rotate to either absorb neutrons, which will shut the reactor down, or continue to reflect neutrons back into the core, which will keep it at its full power level. Clockwise or counterclockwise? Um, both. Because they're not actually spinning completely in a circle. Um, they're rotating slightly to change power level one direction or the other. So depending on what you want to reflect into the core, okay. it just, it'll, it'll alter. But, yeah. but it's not supposed to be moving, right? At, at the, yeah, yeah. basically, operations. if we're at full power operation, though, there are literally no mechanical moving parts full in reflection. this reactor. Yeah. It's, it truly is a solid state. And the only mechanical moving part would be the two shafts on the open or brain cycle turbine. So, you know, when, when you remove all those components, you make this simple. That's where we say, well, the operator has very little to do. You know, there may be, you know, some applications, operations where we give them some amount of manual control, the bypass valve on the power conversion. But even that, when you're forming a small grid, it would be very hard for an operator to move a bypass valve manually fast enough. Uh, it probably may be impossible, depending on the size of the grid. So if, it, if this was only the only thing supporting the grid, yeah, you probably can't do it. Because literally, someone turns on a, a small motor, you might have to click that bypass valve closed another couple percent. Mm -hmm. But it's so that's where you know. It's it's really the system we think that gets you to a true battery design in nuclear. Um, we didn't see any other way really to make it any simpler, quite quite honestly. Go ahead. So the non-nuclear components, your, your actual uh, generator there, uh, is can you shut the this whole unit down and then get in and do your standard maintenance on mm -hmm. the mechanical objects? Yep. Yep, so the power conversion unit is physically separated. It's you know, it's obviously piping interaction, but um that is shielded, etc. If you had shut this down, you could you could work on the power conversion. Um the INC also has redundant trains. So if you know we would need to do an upgrade or something that comes obsolete, we do one train, switch it over, and then do the other train. Um just a comment on the heat pipe spike. Mm -hmm. How big is uh, Westinghouse's vendor or supplier list? 1,800? Oh, God, it's way more than that. <laughs> and I probably well, got well, criticized for this in my previous role. Yeah, yeah. Too big. Yeah. And it's like 8,000. So 8,000 8, vendors, right? So our, our supply chain is 8,000 large. And that's the benefit of Westinghouse. We have such a massive supply chain. Um, when we were fabricating and trying to figure out how to manufacture the heat pipes we went to that massive supply chain and no one can do it yeah. it wasn't available out 
and Westinghouse developed the concept and then figured out how to do ourselves. So we are now manufacturing our own heat pipes and we have other industries coming to Westinghouse to say, oh, you can do this for us. Can 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 you also do it for, for ourselves? So that's the benefit of you know Westinghouse developing the technology is you know we are taking what the ideas are in, in CAD and PowerPoints, but also proving what can and can't be done with the supply chain, which we expect will be challenged with some of the other entities out there. And I'll also point out the heat pipe reactor design. So since we conceptualize this, there are two other vendors, which I will, will not name, but they okay. that, are, that are saying they are heat pipe reactors as well now. Uh, one of them has spent a fair amount of time in Alaska. But we have actually an exclusive license with Los Alamos for this technology for nuclear. So we're a little bit interested in how some of these other technologies would actually be able to execute their design physically. It's actually somewhat easy to design a nuclear reactor on paper. It's extraordinarily difficult to actually license it. And then even if you can license it, then actually manufacture it. Bring it to life. <laughs> right. And so, you know, we've gotten now some, as we've been more public about this, people are starting to realize that this is probably the way you have to go, especially in a very difficult, you know, installation area. Um, you know, even some of the discussions at Ielsen, I think some people's eyes started to open up when they started to realize how difficult it would be to dig deeply into the ground at Ielsen, especially with PFAS and PFOA in the ground and all these other, and permafrost and all these other things, right? And you can also see people starting to, like, realize this. We were, were talking about this seven years ago. Oh, so if it's a design that has a subsurface. <laughs> it would be difficult. And there are quite a few of those in this in this in the micro reactor space, right? And we had looked at that and said, well, you know, for a permafrost area or this continuous permafrost to do underground, we just thought you probably can't do it. It's too hot of a device that's now in the ground. And, and you guys know you can't melt it and then let this thing slide around and when it's basically a mud bottle. <laughs> you know, and the NRT will never allow that either, I think, rightfully so. So, you know, there's things like that that we had factored that drove us this direction. Also, some of the questions on, well, how do you operate? We thought they're in load faller. We thought, well, if you have a system, you need a bunch of folks clicking buttons in a small grid. Mm -hmm. We weren't sure that that could be physically done, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like, how can you control these pumps and valves in a three megawatt? microgrid be really difficult, if not impossible, right? So it all drove us, like all these considerations, a lot of them that we picked up from here have driven, drove the team back in the day. This is the way we had to go. Marianne's giving me the keep, keep oh, going. Yeah. <laughs> oh, since, since we're on the slide and we don't have to go through all the slides, but because uh, I'm sure the question will come up here. And I, I tried to touch on it at the start of the conversation, you know, on the, on the, byproduct the waste side of things, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's really important for, for us to concept of no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> to understand. So the the spent fuel from Da Vinci after eight years, that spent fuel will fit in a large box. We don't have the complete dimensions yet, but that's what we have to be responsible for to st safely store and secure and do something with, right? So eight years of five megawatts uh, full power. Uh, leaves us with a uh, you know a medium sized box of, of fuel, which will be the ownership of Westing us to figure out what to do with. But uh, that's just something that we want to put on the table because we always get that question: Well, what about the waste? You know, it's going to last for a long time. Well, how do we store it? Um, well, the part of the discussions is for these larger legacy plants; they're being required now to store the spent fuel on site. Mm -hmm. um, some of the discussions I've had, certainly every presentation I've had from from a similar uh, technology proponent, um, you all want the fuel back. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's not uh, again. It's it's not something that's meant or anticipated to be left on site. Correct. We're um, licensing this as a fissile material transport container, 
So when it is discharged, again, like a battery, you, you can't recharge it necessarily on site. You could, but it, we thought that also would be extraordinarily difficult in the remote area. You just take this away, you swap it out. And, and for the communities or even for some of the industrial applications that might not need it for the whole life, but they're done after eight or what, uh, 16 years or whatever it is, we can return the site to Greenfield. We can remove everything and bring it back with, with no disruption. Mm -hmm. And the spent rods, um, could, do they have application in smaller nuclear settings such as medical? Um, good question. The spent fuel, not not so much in medical, but um, you know maybe I'll answer. We actually can create isotopes with this reactor. Okay. So we you see the control rods there? Those are really only necessary for transport. Um, because you need extra shutdown capability for different accident scenarios and transport. You can follow water, you can, you know, who knows? Um, we need very few of those to have redundant shutdown capability once it's installed. So you basically have a bunch of extra slots. Mm -hmm. And we, we're actually working on the machine to drive, they can drive isotope targets into the core and remove them while the reactor is generating electricity or heat. It's, it's yeah. public information, so, yeah. I, so I can share this. Uh, Westinghouse has worked with Nordian uh, in Ottawa, um, Canada, on being able to uh, inject, uh, uh, insert, not inject, insert uh, cobalt-59 into uh, PWR, light water reactors in the US. And then after two or three cycles, be able to take that as cobalt-60, which is used for sterilization, uh, medical surgeries as well. So uh, we're just taking some of that novel concept and trying to see what isotopes can be produced within the eventual reactor. So I think there's about 25 isotopes. Yeah, no commercial or, or useful viability. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. we're not going to brought everybody. Maybe hopefully we'll get everybody to be able to go down and score the Idaho National Lab. Mm -hmm. Because we've got, we very well, high level for some of the things you all have been talking about. Yeah. So we got some a couple yeah, of pictures. Why don't we skip through to, mm -hmm. yeah. to show you a bit of the uh, the, the Walt Snow facility. I, I think yeah, uh, that. Hey, hey, Jomo. Jomo. Yes. Hey, so I have a question in regards to the 8,000 suppliers. Is that what you said? Yep. Okay. So then in the world situation as is today, rare earth elements are coming from China. Europe's depending on uh, Russia for natural gas, which is not anymore. So then my question is, of those 8,000 vendors, how many are domestic and how many are foreign and how many are friendly to the United, to the nation? To yeah, the great question. So I would say all 8,000 are friendly countries. Um, and there's it's almost as a relate as as just naturally because of nuclear technology. We generally cannot do nuclear work in an unfriendly country. Mm -hmm. Now, what I will say is we have some suppliers in China in that. So you, you know, depending on your world point of view, you may not call China friendly. And I'm not saying in one way or another, but that's the right answer, but. We do have suppliers in China because of our AP-1000s were built there. We have four of them there. But most of the AP-1000 supply chain is actually in the United States. So the 8,000, and, and it's this won't be perfect numbers, but my guess would be about 5,500 would be U.S. Probably about 1,000 are Western Europe, or, or maybe even 2,000 Western Europe, and that leaves you with maybe 500 just kind of scattered all over. We have some in South Africa, for instance, because there's a nuclear plant there. We have a couple in Brazil. We have some in Chile and Argentina. You know, there's, but I'd say we're 99% friendly. And Russia, the situation in Russia is actually benefiting Westinghouse somewhat greatly right now. We are now supplying a lot of components and even fuel to the Russian design plants that reside in Eastern Europe including Ukraine. We're the only vendor right now that can make fuel for the Russian plants. And we also just had a, an announcement that we are now 49% owned by Cameco, which is obviously a friendly source of uranium product. It's Saskatchewan, Canada, right? So we're, you know, we're actually doing work to 
drive the supply chain to fully Western countries on the uranium side as well, because Westing also plays a key role in that space. But just coming back to Vinci, Mike, uh, what would you say for what's required for Vinci? That's Vinci is 100% US Canada, no doubt about it. 100%. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Um, so then, are there any key components in those non-friendly nations that would really hinder the project? Nope. Okay, good. Thanks. Nope. It, we we don't have rare earth element needs really, aside from uranium, somewhat that, but it's actually quite common. Um, we can get the uranium from Western countries, including Canada. Um, and then the rest is mostly metal and the graphite. We're actually looking at um, potentially even getting that out of West Virginia. Um, we get it out of the U.S. already, but we're looking at some new suppliers and in, in some areas that have been economically, uh, you know, damaged over the past you know, 20, 30 years. So a lot of this out there. Um, speaking of graphite, uh, again, so much of this is about how you protect the fuel itself, the uranium. The, the fissile, fissile material. Um, can you talk about that? I mean, one of the presentations we've had, a number of the presentations talk about tri-fuel. Triso. Yeah. Triso fuel. Uh, when we were down at the lab, they showed us essentially the, the battery guts of the Voyager battery. And it looked like, um, it was really about the size of a three inch cannonball mm -hmm. um, with a, you know, probably about an inch, sphere, inch diameter sphere of uh, uranium yep. coated with graphite. And of course, the graphite was there to, again, protect the fuel. Um, whereas now this triso fuel is uh, very small. Um, but looking at the layers, I mean, it's protected almost like an M1 Abrams tank. Armor. Yes. It's like Chobham armor <laughs> around, around this this grain of, of fissile material. Yep. Is this something similar? Or what? We're using, you're utilizing triso fuel. Okay, I think there's this. Yeah. yeah, it's the it's exactly what you saw. And just to explain, if anyone hasn't heard about this, but it's as Joe Joe is completely correct. It's it's particles about the size of the end of your pen, your ballpoint pen of mm -hmm. uranium, and then those are coated with a graphite layer and a silicon carbide layer, and that that silicon carbide layer can withstand the highest temperature basically that that kernel could ever achieve. So that's where the DOE says, I think it's more credible that the US government is saying like, this is a, a meltdown proof fuel. <laughs> so what's the mass of that with the, all the coverings? The mass with all the coverings is in the- Let's try that a different way. They let us hold a sample of it. Um, so again, the one that was in Voyager was about the size of my fist. Mm -hmm. The uranium plus the graphite coating. These look like poppy seeds. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm thinking about an application um, in a pacemaker. Oh, so so that's why I wondered what the mass was. So the mass of a tri single triso particle would be less than well less than a gram. Um, you know, the, the we're using some people are using cylinder uh, spheres, <laughs> three inch cylinders. Our cylinders are about this big. You know, uh, and that cylinder is probably 20 grams or something. I mean, it's pretty small, pretty light. Graphite's not that heavy. The uranium is heavy, but it's the, there's only in the particle itself, there's only like 30% of that is uranium. And like the other 70 is graphite and other filler material and silicon carbide, which are relatively. I didn't mean to take us on a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a great question. It was, yeah, yeah, that was one of the poor. Working to develop a, a non. Offer, you know, to not have to go through an operational procedure to replace the battery in a pacemaker. Yeah. That's getting old. Yeah. And there has been some work on this. I don't think Westinghouse is dabbled in this space, but there have been some work on um, like true tiny batteries powered by fissile material mm -hmm. that uses, I think mostly they're using just radioactive decay. Heat and it's just creating some enough energy to, to be a small battery. But there's some people out there looking. Yeah. Well, you can keep, yeah, keep, you can keep going. Just come back to the, the point yeah, I made at start. I, mean, we so Joma, some, I had one question on that last slide in regards to transportation. Hold on, Carl. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, go so, ahead, Carl. I noticed it didn't have any air lift on that. Is What's the restriction? Because there are villages out there that 
of course, are not on the river, and um, you know they need to get there by air. So, what, what's the restriction here on that? Yeah, so air transport, um, we would like to be able to do that someday. There are some things we've even started looking at of low ground, slow transport, maybe even using like a uh, harder uh, balloon lift and things like that. But one of the challenges is, and the Department of Defense obviously gets past this, they can fly around nuclear weapons and things, and it's, <laughs> it's what they do. Flying a commercial nuclear reactor, though, the maximum credible accident you have to design for is this thing, the plane crashing or it falling out of the sky. It's That's extraordinarily difficult to do. Not impossible. It would just be a huge, massive effort for us. Yeah. But we're looking at some things. Well, if you do it at a slower speed, if you keep it very close to the ground, you know, there might be ways you can do that. But then if there's tree cover and other things, it gets, you know, it's super complicated. But if we were in like a very barren type area across ice or other things, you might you might be able to do it. But air travel, we're not super focused on. It's, it's just very or challenging. Air, trans air transportable. Yeah, air transport. But what we're in, we've been talking to some of the transportations we are looking at, right? Yeah, now. yeah. And, and, you know, we're looking at basically all the other modes of transportation are very feasible. One thing that could be done in the future for the villages that are off grids, they're also generally smaller, you know, for power up within this. So what we've been planning on is go commercial with five megawatts. You start to build these like cars on an assembly line and you get your costs down. Then you can support shrinking this reactor. And this reactor can be shrunk almost trivially easily. You just take rings off of and you just shrink the diameter down. And we're actually doing a project for NASA right now for a space reactor because this, this technology can get the smallest. Um, so if we could go down to a smaller level, and then the other way you could potentially do support those, those off-grid, non-river accessible areas would be you fly the reactor in without fuel. Then you would have to put the fuel in at the site, Same. but that has challenges, right? Mm -hmm. But it makes the air transport physically able to be done. But that's just some concept stuff. I mean, we're not, we would never advertise right now we can we can support a, yeah. that type of situation yet. Okay. We'd like to someday. Okay. I think uh, one of the takeaways from all of these presentations is that again, it's, there's still work to being done. Mm -hmm. um, again, we're, we're moving down a path. We're moving down a path, and we, we've gone from the Surrey Power Plant um, that, again, is hundreds of acres. It's a huge facility, um, and, you know, sending out spacecraft with <laughs> cannonball-sized pieces of material um, to, again, things that are down to, you know, again, poppy seeds clad in chobham armor <laughs> um, and can fit in just a couple of acres of space. But we just still work to do. If you could go to the next slide, real, sure. just real quick, right? Uh, so I wanted to say, you know, you what go. what have we done in the last couple of years? We have now installed all the equipment to make twelve foot heat pipes. We're making one right now. We have done a massive amount of additional testing on our four foot pipes. We ran our electrical de demonstration unit, which you can see in the lower uh, corner there in the front. Uh, when I was here before, we were talking about we were going to run that. We ran that last year. Um, so we ran up this a cell of our reactor with heat pipes, full operating temperature, uh, got all the data we needed out of that. It was a very, you know, it, we basically proved concept, all those things you know, working. We have uh, started interaction with USNRC. So we are submitting doc, technical documentation to US, at USNRC. We've sent- And that's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Yep, we have sent our, our all of our key topic areas, security, emergency planning, operation, all those things to NRC for review um, in a pre-licensing process, but that's the process that they prefer and, and we do as well. Um, and we committed to operate our reactor, uh, a test reactor at Idaho National Labs at the EBR2 tone just about a month ago. So we had teams at I know while well, well, you were there actually I wasn't there but we had a bunch of people at I know the last three weeks, um, you know so we're we're now in the process of really bringing this to reality physically, 
And that's a big difference, I think, between where Westinghouse is and some others right now. There's a lot of concept stuff, but we're now, we're committed to make this a reality. Nick, I saw some of this. We were in one lab. Uh, they had an operating reactor, and I could, I could, it was just across the room. Mm -hmm. um, and they were using for uh, heat regularization those, as you noted, those control rods yep. that turn the drums, yep. the drums, where it would, again, if it reflects mm -hmm. the neutrons back, it heats up. If they turn, it cools down. Um, so yeah, I, I was yep. sitting there right next to it. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We try to take as much existing technology, materials, etc., and then integrate that into this design. But the heat pipes were the key because we just didn't see anyone else on earth that could make a nuclear safety related sodium heat pipe. <laughs> But um, this is kind of an often or in details, maybe not for everybody here, but later on, remind me, I want to ask you about how you control the flow of the new, or is the, the neutrons, are they in a linear path? Um, or how do you control the directionality of them as if it's controlling whether, how it responds? Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. So there's, there's, there's shielding inside that canister and a reflector as well. So we're basically trying to connect and contain the neutrons actually and also radially where, you know, to get maximum efficiency. But then those drums, when they turn to shut down, they can absorb enough that it shuts it down. But we're keeping the neutrons, as many of them as we can, completely contained in the reactor. Neutron leakage is just wasted. Yeah. It's wasted energy, right? right? Thank you. Yep. And this is easily modeled by... I mean, we've been doing this for six, 80 years now. Yeah, so right. we can yeah. model that. Yeah. It's a good question. Though. Really good question. Yeah. I'm, I'm learning for it. <laughs> questions. Well, everybody, we are past the top of the hour. Um, I would, if I, you know, we have a little extra time. Are there any questions online? Are there any further questions from anyone in the, everyone in the room? I just want to say one point. Please. We, we'd love to host you in Walt's Mill uh, at the Vinci, so where, where we have the R&D facility. Oh. So okay. if there's ever an appetite from the group here or a team or whatever, just please work with uh, Marianne and, and ourselves and, and we'll, we'll give you a bit of a tour. Field trip, field trip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, we have not just this facility that you can see and, and all the, we actually have three times the space now for Evinci stuff. This is just what's on the slide. We also have full size pressurized water reactor components. So we have reactor vessel head, you know, steam generator. So if you can also see, this is what the real big plants, it's all there. We have it all at the same facility. So it's it's pretty pretty nice setup we have. You can learn a lot, just like you probably did at the lab. Like you, you just get you can pick up everything in a day because <laughs> it's all there. Well, not everything. Not everything. <laughs> um, but again, it was it really was neat to see. Again, they were both testing technologies, um, but also components. I saw another program, like one of the big inhibitors. You can you can steal a copy of the design for say the jet engine that's in the F-35. Um, and you know that some of our adversaries have, um, but part of the trick is the, is the metallurgy. Yeah. Yeah. Is the metallurgy yeah. uh, being able to actually build the components, fabricate the components that can withstand those kinds of, that kind of operation. Absolutely. Um, so that's part of it. They also had a really great lab talking about, they were studying things that we could do with this power. If this kind of power was available. Marvel. Um, which was really neat from micro smelting and fabrication to uh, just direct use of the, what, what was, what would be called waste heat other places here are just very valuable BTUs in particular in a community. I hadn't thought about this until we were having these discussions, but we have four uh, distributed heating systems in our community uh, between the military bases, the university and downtown. We would seem to have a leg up on possible yes. utilization of this kind of technology. Mm -hmm. um, we're just on a heat distribution yeah. basis. Yeah, Wainwright has a distribution as well. That's right. Wainwright, Eielson, the University, and Fairbanks. And is downtown Aurora, so we hit, runs to the end of its life. Does it? it? It's coming up, and 
we would we don't want the downtown people to be without heat their water heat that's a that's been a yeah. real asset to the community and it'd be really nice if they didn't have to transition to hydrocarbon fuels mm -hmm. um either a whole bunch more furnaces or mm -hmm. although no offense carl or even natural gas again we it would seem we would seem we would have a leg up for utilization of this kind of technology with our distributed heating system did you meet yasser arafat at I know. I did not. Uh, I like the Yasser? No, he's dead. Um, yeah, he's oh, dead. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> so, so that, no, I did not meet Yasser Arafat. You that know, micro reactor. The other, kind of oh, the other one. <laughs> that micro reactor test bed where they're trying to figure out what he's, he runs that. Oh, okay. He might not have been there at the time, but he was one of the four people that developed this concept. Ah. Okay. And he went out to the next last thing else. Next yeah. thing else yeah. And then finally, that reactor that I spoke of, um, that again, they, they talked about how they regulated the, its utilization with these turning control mm -hmm. rods. What they were actually using that reactor for was materials testing. And so it actually had the slots within the reactor where they should drop in different yeah. materials to see how they reacted to, to, to these kinds of temperatures. Um, yeah, and your F-35 example was perfect because that's what we have done with these heat pipes. If you saw the draw, if you got the drawing for the heat pipe, it's like it's not that novel. Something <laughs> for a straw. Yeah, yeah. But to actually figure out how to draw these tubes and the thicknesses and actually make it, it's it's not trivial, right? So that's where everybody, you know, people are saying, I have a heat pipe reactor, but I can say cartoon versus reality. That's why I don't mind giving away the uh, recipe to my eggnog. Because I, know, <laughs> I know nobody's going to sit there and stir that for 12 hours. Like I <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, cool. I have one more question. You may. So um, we are sort of locked into GVA and we are paying uh, an enormous amount of cost for a kilowatt compared to the rest of the nation. What? To your in your experience or what you have out there right now, what is the average cost of a kilowatt for for this reactor design? I assume, yeah. So so yeah, right now what we released publicly was a study we did a while ago now about a year, um, which was first reactor could be twenty five cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, since that time, there's obviously been some inflation and other things, right? So that's probably come up just because of cost of money in the last year. But we've come up less than diesel and other the, the other technologies. So it's, you know, inflation is actually maybe even beneficial for us. So you know, somewhere in the 20s to high 20s is about right now. We have exact numbers. We just don't publicly talk about them very much. And then LCOE for nth of a kind with the new investment tax credits from the Inflation Reduction Act, we could get maybe mid-teens delivered electricity. So that's one of the reasons why we're very quite excited about this technology. So, so Jomo, correct me if I'm wrong, and Steve as well, I mean, we're paying into the 20 cents a kilowatt right now with what we have. So. What's the advantage of this? Um, the advantage would be we can get down to the teens. It's a non-emitting technology. Um, it's also much more resilient from an operation perspective. The reliability on this, given its simplicity, should be one of the most reliable energy generation technologies that there is. And the existing nuclear plants, even though they're quite complex, are extraordinarily reliable. And then I would say, you know, just lastly, the fuel life allows for price certainty mm -hmm. over a long period of time, which you right. really cannot get from anything else other than potentially renewables. And even that has, you know, major challenges, as you guys know very well. You know, very just well. adding to that, the cost of power adjustments that the utilities see vary on a quarterly basis. And, you know, they're at the, the basically the demand of what the market is doing and the price of diesel, fuel oil, naphtha, everything else. Mary, you're, Mary Ann, you're talking to the choir. We don't need to be reminded of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I guess finally, um, I mean, that, that 20 to 15 to 25 cents per kilowatt hour, again, that doesn't, that is not factoring BTUs. Correct. Heat, heat capturing heat economically would also 
or could potentially improve yes. those numbers on the total Correct. energy profile picture. Yes. Yeah, and I, I guess Matt, the only thing I'd add to the two is the, the earlier adopters of this technology will be the ones that just don't have access to your the 25 cent that you're paying right now. Right? So it's, if you're it's looking at remote communities or industrial applications or research or some utilities trying to do some novel concepts of hydrogen production, right? when you get to the end of the kind and this is a more of a commercialized product, you know, then you can start looking at applications to possibly displace the, the current energy production. But, you know, we don't see this knocking natural gas out of the way in, in, in communities and in city centers. I and mean, that's not the concept, but this is really for those remote community, edge of grid applications at the start, and then eventually at some point, and you can look at uh, other applications mm -hmm. that are more traditional. Yeah. And Allison, yesterday at the base, you know, we had uh, the the free RFP response meeting there yesterday. You know, their words, they said, you know, it's not in this RFP, but this coal plant cannot, will not last physically forever. <laughs> you know, we are interested in, if this project is successful, continuing to scale units just at Allison. Um, you know, you guys know that that plant's been obsolete probably for 25 years. I personally work in a plant just like it. <laughs> and the value of coal is completely, um, completely incorrectly valued. Yeah. Sir, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Ten, 10 years ago, uh, when LED lighting was just starting to appear, um, power was 75 cents a kilowatt hour in the villages. And when, at the time when I was working at Design Alaska, it's like, this is a great way for us to justify trying this out like like taking them on the bleeding edge and it's really hand out for them i think that there would be a similar sort of thing you know you talk about 20 by 20 i think we just dropped a little bit our my last bill i've been tracking it for ever since i got electricity when i first uh, escaped america and came to alaska and, <laughs> and uh it's gone from five to um two months ago it was 26.8 cents a kilowatt mm -hmm. hour it dropped to 25 point two on the most recent bill so you're right there on the on the cusp of it working for the second largest urban center in alaska but out in the villages with triple and, mm -hmm. and probably even more now yeah it oh, it is because of the it's 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 right right and i'm talking to you so it's a, i'll bet it's higher mm -hmm. so yeah you know just as you the led lighting would be that was a place to try it out you know, or it could be economically justified. This sounds like this could be for the micro reactors as well. Well, hey, everybody, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, just really quick. So uh, we'll just wrap this up uh, for the record. I'm about to stop the recording. So again, thanks everybody for coming. Fairbanks Economic Development, Andrew for All, all Alaska Task Force. I want to thank our friends from Westinghouse for joining us. Thank and you. we did a deep dive in some nuclear rights. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but for folks, uh, who would like to do a, even more of a dive again do re be reminded uh, that this evening at 6 p.m at the Fairbanks Pipeline Training Center Westinghouse Mr. Ballor will be there as well as some other vendors uh potential vendors well sorry they're all vendors hoping or competing to possibly the selected uh, technology for the IELTS and RFP, but they will be making themselves available to the public. There'll be brief presentations from each one of the groups regarding themselves and their technology, and then it will be open mm -hmm. to Q&A from the residents of Fairbanks. So don't miss it. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Uh, I don't know what I'll be doing with you people next week, uh, so I'll just be in contact. <laughs> um, all right, but again, enjoy the rest of your uh, Thursday, the rest of your nuclear Thursday here in Fairbanks, and we'll talk Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.